Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. My name is Amy Draves, and I'm here to introduce John Long, who is joining us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. John is here to discuss his book, Darwin's Devices, What Evolving Robots Can Teach Us About the History of Life and the Future of Technology. Evolving robots can illustrate the power of evolution, illuminating mysteries such as how the flexible spines of fish and mammals developed, or whether or not brains are really necessary for some species' survival. These robots mimic, and simplify animals and allow John and his colleagues to witness evolution in, pro in progress. John Long is a professor at, of biology and cognitive science at Vassar. He is the director and co-founder of Vassar's Interdisciplinary Robotics Research Laboratory. Please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Well, thank you, Amy, and, and thanks to Microsoft for inviting me here today. And when I talk about Darwin's devices, what I'm really talking about are evolving robots. And so that's going to be the focus here. And I'm going to talk to you about why we do this crazy thing of evolving robots, why I go through all the trouble of doing that. And then I'll talk to you about how we do it. And maybe you can get some ideas or have some critiques for us about what our process is. I want to make sure that we start off with an understanding of what I mean and what biologists mean by evolution. As you know, evolution is fraught with misunderstanding out there in the world. So when I'm talking about evolution, I want to talk about the definition that we use, which is a change in the genetics of a population from generation to generation. Individuals do not evolve, I'm sorry to tell you. Okay, You'll have to find other ways to improve your self-esteem. Individuals develop, you can grow, but you cannot evolve. That's something that's the property of a group of interbreeding individuals who are together at any place in time. Evolution takes place from generation to generation. Okay, so that's where we're going to start in terms of thinking about our evolutionary process. And I want to give you some uh, bad cartoons of a fish that I drew to, to illustrate how a little bit about how evolution works. I know you guys know this, but this is just a little remedial work for you since maybe you haven't thought about evolution in a few years. So we have a population, our group of interbreeding organisms. Let's call this generation one. There's a variety of colors here, and let's presuppose that each of these colors of the body has a genetic basis to it. There are genes that code for it. And let us also suppose that there's a predator out there that really likes blue fish, okay? Or a bunch of these predators, so that after a while, the predators have selected, that is, they've eaten all the blue fish, and they end up leaving behind the survivors, and those survivors become the parents. And notice that the, the blue and blue-green are gone here. These remaining individuals in the population are the ones that reproduce. Again, there's a genetic basis to that color. And they produce a population here that, when we compare to the parental population, is quite different. Okay? So, Notice I've avoided the awful iconography of evolution of, you know, this kind of thing, you know, standing up, which is, it's horribly racist and other things, okay, that's, uh, that's not the way to think about evolution. Evolution is this process of filtering, if you will, from one generation to the next and the change in the underlying structure. So that's what we're going to start off with here. So now we're going to talk about why, as a biologist, I want to evolve robots. And I want to evolve robots because, as a biologist, I've run out of rope. There's only so much you can study when you have the animal in front of you, believe it or not, or in the case of what was happening 500 million years ago, all we have are the fossils. We have some beautiful fossils out of China, which I'll show you in just a second. This is an artist's imagination of what a little fish called Hykuichthys ericucaneus might have looked like. These guys were about an inch long, and they were, we find them in schools. And so we think they were up in the water column swimming. And what's important about these guys is that they're the first complete vertebrates that we have. So we are members of the vertebrate subphylum. And so because of that, in our uh, universal um, 
centricism about our kind, we want to understand where we come from, right? Do our family history studies. So 500 million years ago, the first vertebrates were evolving. They're so named, these vertebrates, because of what? Where do we come up with that name? Sorry, I can't help being a professor. <laughs> yes, the backbone, exactly. The bones in your back, those individual bones, are each one of those is called a vertebra. As plural, they're called vertebrae. We talk about a vertebral column or a backbone that means collectively all that, that entire structure. Oddly enough, the first vertebrates did not have much in the way of vertebrae. It's one of the paradoxes of our kind. Okay, so for me, as somebody who's really interested in the origins of our group and loves fish and things like that, I want to know, okay, well, what was going on early on? What were the selection pressures that may have driven the origin of the backbone of these actual physical structures in the axial skeleton of these early vertebrates? Now, the problem is, this is the data we have from 500 million years ago. Um, I don't know if this looks like much to you guys, but if you're used to seeing fossils of soft tissue, this material here that you see in tan is just gorgeous, right? Fossils are usually bone. It's the only thing that survives a mudslide and degradation and actually gets mineralized, that process called taphonomy, to create a fossil. These fossils are actually, like right here, we have pretty good evidence that these are actually eyes and the pigment or the cups from eyes. So here's an artist or a scientist who's drawn a rendering of these little discolorations of the sand, okay, from China. This is the Chinese, uh, uh, let's see, there's a Lagerstadt in southeast China where these come from. So we think we see eyes, maybe some nasal cavities. Over here you can see, if you've ever eaten fish, the segmented muscles of a fish. And internally even, we can see evidence that there's a structure called a notochord. A notochord is the backbone without any bones. And there may even be these little blobs, some experiments with vertebrae in that notochord. So the ancestral condition, meaning the first condition that vertebrates had without vertebrae, was this notochord and then vertebrae evolved. So these are actually gorgeous fossils. My wife is a, a botanist, right? And she she looks at something like this and she goes, looks like a leaf. What's the big deal? And it's not quite as easy as you get to see whatever you want to see, the Rorschach test of fossils. So these are gorgeous fossils. Trust me on that. And one of the neat things about this find um, coming out of China is that there are so many of them. There's been 50 specimens or so of Hykuichthys that have been found and described for us. Okay, so given that these are excellent fossils, it's almost the best we can get, but the problem is that fossils tell no tales, right? We are missing really important things about the lives of these animals from fossils. So this is a dead, beautiful dead, a living species called a, a viper moray, but it's dead right here. This picture was taken by Sandra Rarden, and I, I have this here because you can see each one of those little vertebrae that are in this viper moray right here. But the problem is when you're dead, you're dead. You don't have any behavior. If all you have is a representation of the dead animal, you don't have its ecology, where the ecology is the interaction of that group of organisms with themselves and with other kinds of organisms and with the world. All of that's missing. Of course you know that with fossils, but if you're a biologist and you want to figure out what had happened 500 million years ago, that's the stuff you need to have. You need to have the behavior and you need to have the ecology available to you. So this is a picture of a robot we call Tadro, and um, I think this is an homage. I put this in for this talk. Um, I threw this in Biorobotica Piscina. I don't know if you remember the Wiley Coyote stuff, when the coyote's running and, and they stop it and they're like coyote hungry kiss. You know, they fake the Latin binomial scientific name. I thought I'd throw that in there for you guys. Because I figure you're all nerds, right, like me, and you, you probably watch still, as I do, you know, those, those classic Looney Tunes. All right, so there's Biorobotica piscina, fish-like biorobot. And one of the cool things we can do with our robots, because we can make them autonomous, and I'll explain what I mean, which you guys probably know in a second, we can sort of make the models undead representations of these fossils. So we can recover behavior, and we can model the ecology and the ecological interactions. So what we do here 
in some ways is replay the game of life. Okay, those dynamic interactions that may have occurred. So we're modeling evolutionary processes with our robots. Okay, so we can ask a very specific question. In my lab, we can ask, why did the vertebrae evolve? What do we think was going on there? What was the selection pressure that maybe drove that evolution of that very important axial skeleton? This is a specific case of a very general question of why did evolution happen the way that it did? It is the problem with any historical study. You always want to understand what happened. And it's very difficult to do so. There are methods to do it, but you're always left saying, well, this is our best guess at what's happening. So I'm going to go through all this, talk to you about this, and I'm going to say, well, this is our best guess of what was happening. But it's a matter of testing ideas and circumscribing the feasible and the stuff that you can't say is feasible. You say, well, it's probably unlikely that it happened in a, in a way that we haven't described here. So that's the why, and now I want to do is, what I want to do is talk to you about the how of the evolving robots, what we're doing in our laboratory. We build a special class of robot that's called a biorobot. Biorobots are, in particular, and this is an example, Tadro is an example of it, they're physically embodied. Some people talk about building robots in digital simulation. We do that also, but we wouldn't call them biorobots. They are meant specifically to mimic or represent an animal. And they also have to test ideas about how animals behave. They're not just, oh, let's cool, let's build a fish. We're building a fish with certain properties that relate to fossil fishes so that we can test ideas about how we think fossil fishes may have been evolving. So that's a bio-robot. And we're going to talk about six questions that we ask when we do a study like this. Well, they're not questions. I got thrown off by that. Six things we need to do. Thing one, ask a question. Thing two, we have to pick an animal. Thing three, we have to pick an environment. You know, there is a very specific matching of any particular species with the environment in which it evolved, right? And this is an important thing. Animals don't just evolve in a vacuum. Or actually, they could, they, well, do they evolve in a vacuum? That would be a different kind of environment, wouldn't it? Anyway, I guess they could, but they don't. Okay, we're mimicking specific features, and then we're creating a genetics that we need to talk about what an evolutionary process is, and then we're applying selection, okay, the creative force of evolution. And for more details, you can refer to chapter five of Darwin's devices. So let's start with asking a question. Um, and by the way, this is to remind me that when we do the evolution of these robots, we have a further restriction of kind of robots, and we call them, because we need a silly name, we call them Evolvabots, okay? Evolving bio-robots are what we're working with here. So back to our beautiful Viper Moray. We can ask a very specific question now that has in it some assumptions that I'll unpack a little bit later. But here's the question. Did the first vertebrates evolve vertebrae as an adaptation for improved feeding and fleeing, for eating and not being eaten? Okay, I'll explain why we think that's important in a bit. I'm going to pick an animal. Now, this is not Hycoichthys here. This is an animal called Drepanaspis. And the reason we picked Drepanaspis as our model is Hycoichthys are really tiny, and we don't know tons about them, right? So we actually know, because these are larger animals, about yay big, we know more about their external anatomy. This is actually a 3D model that's based on some three-dimensional fossils. We know, for example, they have uh, where their eyes are, the mouth is located, and a thing called the lateral line that I'll explain in just a second. So that's the animal we're going to pick. Drepanaspis is important because it also contains, even though it's 100 million years younger, than Hycoichthys, it has no jaws, no paired fins, and no vertebrae. These are all ancestral conditions for vertebrates. So they retain many of these ancestral vertebrate characters. Okay, then we need to pick an environment. What's happening 400 million years ago? This is the age of fishes, if you've ever been to a museum, right? Before the age of dinosaurs. And Devonian seas had predators. So here are some shark-like forms and some bony fishes here with jaws. Here's a lungfish thing, okay? And guess what? They all have, believe it or not, notochords. They don't have vertebrae here. So here are these notochordal animals swimming around. Where's Drepanaspis? Well, Drepanaspis isn't here, but a close relative is in this 100-year-old um, rendering of what we think was going on in the Devonian. 
kind of hanging out, has a bony head shield, wiggly tail, and going kind of like beaker, right? Me, 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 don't eat me, big predators right here. Okay, so the idea is we see lots of armor in the Devonian because there are even bigger fishes than this swimming around that uh, can crunch and chew and bite you. And we also see very large and scary arthropods. So it's like the revenge of all that lobster you've eaten. There's a big group of arthropods that literally get, they're six feet tall. Um, they're called Eurypterids. They have big claws, and if you see a uh, fossil of one, you realize you're very glad they're extinct. Okay? Question back there. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, look, I don't, I don't want to be too harsh on artists, but you know, if if we were actually doing a class, I would, and we weren't recording this, I would say, here's an artist's misconception of the Devonian. But since we are recording this, I won't say that. Okay. <laughs> so. Here's the, nine, the, the, the point, point of this for our, for our purposes is it's a marine environment with predators. Okay, and then we want to mimic spe, uh, specific features. So we're back to Drepanaspis over here. Here is our Tadro robot now that we're looking at from above. It's got a stiff, circular-like head region and a flapping propulsive tail. We're going to give our bio robot two different sensory systems, two eyes, and a lateral line. A lateral line is like an external ear. You have hair cells in your ears. And what's actually really cool about this is fishes don't have an inner ear the way we think of it with accelerometers. We've got accelerometers on our head. Do you know? You guys got to, you know, it's like tech. It's like wet tech. It's so cool, right? We know when we're doing this with our head, we've got tilt, tiltometers, inclinometers, I know they're called. Uh, and we've got accelerometers as well. We can do rotational stuff. That's the semicircular canals. Fish actually have the, the rotational uh, work. And it's all from a cog psi point to subtract out self-motion so that the world doesn't feel like it's moving. Right? We can move our head. And, and there's a really cool test of this. If you dare and you don't have contacts in, you know, we move our eyes and we subtract out the motion so the room doesn't move. But if you will push on your eyeball, close your eye and push on your eyeball, and you move your eyeball with your finger, the, the room will move. Okay, so the extrinsic muscles that move your eyeball around are exquisitely innervated and there's a computation happening in your brain to subtract out that self-motion. Um, by the way, um, I don't have any special insurance coverage, so should you have just given yourself some sort of eye injury, <laughs> I'm, don't talk to me about that. <clears throat> okay, so we have eyes, we have this lateral line, which I've just said is an external ear, these hair cells in there. And in our ear, there's all this fluid that moves around. Well, evolutionarily, the, those hair cells were on the body of fishes, and they're retained in fishes. It's a very useful system. You can know in the dark if you're swimming next to somebody. You can school in the dark. You can know if a predator is coming without having to see that predator. Anything in the water produces a bow wave moving forward. So it's like cologne that gets to the room before you do. Okay, the fish cologne is this bow wave that goes out ahead of the, of the critter. Okay, and in case you want to know, so these are photoresistors here, so it's not object-forming lenses, it's simple light detection. And we use an IR proximity detector um, as our proxy for the lateral line there. I'm going to focus for a minute here on what's happening down here. We actually build a biomimetic backbone with variable numbers of vertebrae. So each one of these light points here represents a vertebra that's in our backbone. The reason variation is important is the way natural selection works is like a menu. If there's only one thing on the menu, you can only order one thing. If there are multiple things on the menu, you get to choose, right? So again, it's that screening process that we talked about with evolution. So we need to be able to do variable numbers. We want to be careful also to match the mechanical properties of the vertebral column with mechanical properties of some living form that we know about the biomechanics of, right? And we want to match the anatomy as well. So let me tell you about that process of building a biomimetic backbone. We start off with molds that uh, allow us to build a right circular cylinder that's a hydrogel. So here's a hydrogel here that's been cross-linked 
Um, so it's wet, it's floppy, and then to that hydrogel we slide on rings that are our vertebrae. Okay, and we can vary the number there. So a little more detail. The hydrogels are made of 10% gelatin. Cool thing about gelatin, it's actually made of collagen. Collagen is the primary structural protein that's in skin, tendons, ligaments. Very important. So we're using a biological material that also happens to taste very nice. Gelatin, jello, I don't, you know, nobody cooks anymore, right? It used to be that you make this horrible stuff called jello. It's fine if it's sweet, but like my aunt, she would put like cream cheese and tomato soup in the jello and like serve it as a side at dinner. It's like, are you kidding me? What are you trying to get us to do? Lose weight here? I mean, what's going wrong? What's wrong with you? So, but it is in fact a protein supplement because of all the collagen that's in there. So we have a hydro hydrogel which we fix with a chemical compound called glutaraldehyde so that it doesn't rot like jello would. We have to keep them wet because they will dry out. Put on our ring centra, and here's the variation. We can make the notochord. We can vary vertebral columns from 0 to 11. We fix the length of the vertebral column here, and that's not something that we see in nature, right? It's not that vertebrates have always all been the same size. But what we're doing here is simplifying our model and allowing, by varying the number of vertebrae, the intervertebral joint to change. This is essentially one long joint. For those of you who have a mechanical engineering background, it's a beam of infinite degrees of freedom. When you start putting in joints, you start restricting those degrees of freedom in bending. And by the way, we use sharks as our living model that we try to match mechanical properties of. That's stuff I'm not going to tell you about, but we do biomechanical experiments on isolated shark vertebral columns so that we know we're, you know, at least in the general ballpark of what's biologically feasible. So those are the um, biomimetic vertebral columns, and they act as propulsors and allow us to make behavior. And so I want to explain what I mean by behavior before we go on here, because it's very important to what we do. Remote control is not behavior. This is one of our robots that we call, in the book, Darwin's Devices, an evolutionary trekker. Yes, it's Star Trek homage, right? Evolutionary trekker. ETs for short, which is another joke. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, nerds have all the fun, don't we? Come on, right? And so robot Madeline, which you see from top down here, is a four-flippered evolutionary trekker who in version one was remote control. Okay, so we could get her to do all sorts of wonderful acrobatics, test our ideas about flippered locomotion, okay, but I wouldn't say that she was autonomous or smart. So it's not really behavior that we're doing in the sense of autonomous behavior that we're after. We have a human in the control loop. So it's just like the drones, okay? So how do we make behavior? What are we after? We go for autonomous behavior. So here's Robot Madeline version two. Notice she doesn't have a tether coming off here. She's got a little tail. And inside, she's got a PC-104, and she's running her own routines. She's got sensory input. She's using sonar. She's got a compass. She's got an altimeter. She's pinging with an altimeter. Um, she's got an internal accelerometer for sort of kinesthetic um, logging as well. And now the robot is in control, right? There's no human in the loop once we turn her on. So this is autonomous behavior. And decisions being made by the robot. And this is what I mean when I'm talking about recovering behavior, using robots to cover behavior. It's not remote control. Oh, look, it can swim. It's, it can swim and navigate and do what we need it to do hands off. So when we run our experiments, we literally put the robots in our tank, turn the video camera on, and then step back and let the behavioral interaction unfold. So this is one of the features that we're after, is this autonomous behavior. So just to drive, just to beat a dead horse here, so without sensory input, you know, that's the equivalent of a wind-up toy. If the sensory input is from a human, we're talking about the drones that we currently hear about um, that are flying in Afghanistan and Yemen last week, uh, Robot Madeline version one. And when the sensory input is on the robot and the robot's making the decisions, that's what we call autonomous behavior. And Tadro 4, who's going to be the topic of the rest of the talk today, is an autonomous fish-like robot that shows this kind of autonomous behavior. Okay. So this is something that we recover. How do we do it? How do we get it to behave? I'm going to diagram in broad strokes what the microcontroller that's on the robot, for those of you who care, it's a 
which one did we use here? MIT HandyBoard is what we used for this. And I'm going to call it loosely brain architecture, knowing that it's really not cortex or anything like that. But it is doing something brain-like. We know that in living fishes, they have a very clear way of responding to the stimulus in the world around them. They will cruise along using a nervous system that's called a chain of central pattern generators, which we have central pattern generators too. Any kind of rhythmic motion is a central pattern generator. So they'll just be a fish, do, 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 do. And if a predator comes, boom, they get the heck out of the way. They fast start and they escape. And within 60 milliseconds, they've achieved sometimes accelerations of up to 10 G. Okay, some of the highest accelerations that we see in vertebrates. Okay, so we're actually mimicking that kind of neural control. So we have, in the case of light hitting one of the light sources, we have the sensor that's always asking, is there light, is there light, is there light? Our eye equivalent, and we're in the feeding motor control, the feeding behavior. In the case where there's a predator detected, that's the fleeing behavior here. And if we didn't have some kind of arbitration mechanism, you know, what do you do? Do you, do you eat? Do you escape? Well, we use uh, Rodney Brooks's subsumption hier hierarchy from robotics. And we actually say that, you know what? Fleeing is more important than feeding. And this is exactly how the fish brain works, too. Doesn't matter if you're eating, if you're dead. I know it seems obvious, but there you go. So that's the basic architecture that we have for the nervous system control here. Put this all together in a body that makes this capable, and we talk about from a cognitive science point of view, embedded, in, or excuse me, embodied intelligence. Intelligence that includes the body itself. We're actually going to keep the brain constant and not evolve it. And these animals, listen to me, it's my bias. They're not animals, John. They're models of animals. These robots will actually get better at feeding and fleeing without us changing the brain. And that's one of the cool surprises when we allow the hardware to evolve. Okay, so here are two of our Tadro 4s. This is a Tadro called, can you think of a stupid name for, everybody needs a stupid name, right, for a robot. So a stupid name for this one is Prero. Tadro, Pre, Prero. You can see it's biomimetic vertebral column here with a few vertebrae here. This is the predator Tadro, Tadiator. Okay, huh? That's pretty good. Gladiator, Tadro, Gladiator, okay. And here's a light source that's hung over the tank, and the prey row is trying to orbit around the light source here, and you can see this predator is coming in for the kill. And there's actually no kill, it's just, a, it's just a bump. As you know, whenever you do this stuff, you actually don't want to wreck your machines, right? So even though it'd be really cool, like the train wreck stuff when you were a kid, we don't let it happen. So there they are in action. And what we want to do now, we'll get back to some of the trials and what the evolutionary behaviors look like. What I want to do is just uh, remind you, we've talked about a bunch of features here. Some features we're keeping constant. I mentioned we're not evolving the brain. We're also not evolving the body shape and size. And the behaviors themselves we're keeping constant. What are we going to evolve here? We're going to evolve the number of vertebrae right down here. We're going to evolve the shape of the tail. And you can't see the shape of the tail looking down on this thing. But fish, maybe you know, like eels have a pointed tail. Tunas have a splayed semi-lunate tail. There's all this variation in caudal fin shape that is important in different kinds of propulsive mechanisms. Okay, so we're evolving the tail shape. And then we're evolving the sensitivity of the lateral line. All three of these features are things that we see changing a lot in early vertebrates. I'm just going to be focusing on number of vertebrae because we don't have time to talk about all of that today. Um, but suffice it to say that there are interesting interactions among those traits as well when we look at the evolution of a group of characters. Okay, so that's our specific features. Next up, we need to talk about genetics. How do we get that? We take our evolving features and we assign um, letters to them. So number of vertebrae, we're going to call N genes. Um, the shape of the tail tip we're going to call B genes, so that's for the span of the tail. And then zeta genes are for the sensitivity of the lateral line. We use many different kinds of genes. They're simple quantitative characters. And so we just use, um, just use a number uh, from 0 to 11, 0 to 15, 
and 0 to 50 for our different traits. So they're not Mendelian traits, they're quantitative traits that can just be combined arithmetically. You had a question? Yeah. Is it sensitive to monotonic? Do we really need to uh, change them? All I caught was monotonic. So try me again. Yeah. Isn't sensitivity monotonically like if as you increase sensitivity, wouldn't the automatically become better? I mean, why would you No. Okay, so No, uh, he's asking if we increase sensitivity, wouldn't they automatically become better? If you spend all your time escaping from the predator, you're never going to eat. So I'll show you why that makes sense when we talk about actual ecology in, in a moment. When I show you the fitness function, you'll see that there's a compromise between the different kinds of behaviors. Okay, so it's, it, yeah, evolution is a compromise is my quick response to you there. It's not a bad hypothesis, right? But when you consider other things that the fish have to do, it's never a single optimum that's being Evolution doesn't perfect, I guess is what I want to say. Evolution suffices. It gives you the best solution at the time and place, but it might not be some global optimum at all. Was there another hand up over here? Yeah. I was going to ask if you're going to talk about it, what your population size is, and do you have multiple? Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk okay. about it. Yep, that's coming up right here. Pop I, I work with a mathematician, and so we did Tad the Tadro 3 world. We had three individuals. And so he was always critical about that. John, the mathematics of small numbers is going to overwhelm anything that we're trying to do evolutionarily. So we really worked in Tadrow 4 to come up with, we doubled the population size. So I went to Rob and I said, Rob, we've got a population size of six. And he's like, <laughs> he started laughing. He's like, that's still not good enough. You know, mathematics of small numbers are really going to dominate. So in genetic systems, we talk about the mathematics of small numbers um, as uh, effects like genetic drift you may have heard of. Okay, so there are ways that evolutionary, evolutionary biologists grapple with it. And we know that these effects are present and they're part of the system. So we've got six individuals in a population. What I just want to show you here is about the genetic cycle and what's going on. So pretend for a moment that each of these colors represents a different genotype or a different genome that each individual has. And, um, and that's going to be true for the Tadros. Anything we've set up our genetics, so anything we can measure and see is directly coded. If you know anything about population genetics, we'd say there was a heritability of one. Okay, there's no fabricational noise in our system. Okay, and what we do is do the selection that we talked about earlier, and we reward in our system the top three performers in any generation are the ones that get to breed. Okay, so the sea green color here um, gets, now we're going to make eggs and sperm. So the top winner, the gold medal winner, gets six egg and sperm that it puts into the gene pool. Our silver medal winner gets four egg and sperm. And our bronze medal winner gets two. So it's a simple ranking scheme here. The differences of the pie slice, the differences in hue, represent the fact that we've mutated a random mutational operator, the genome. And so, for example, each one of these gametes is slightly different in terms of the number that it's giving to the population. It resembles the parent, but it's slightly different. So we're salting in variation into our system genetically, just like what happens in real life. This is a genetic algorithm, by the way, if you're used to this kind of stuff for your design processes. So in this gene pool, we then randomly combine these haploid gametes into combinations, pairs, of genotypes that now give us the instructions for the new genotype for the next generation. So the next generation, just like we did previously, it resembles the individuals that actually made it through, right? So this was our top winner, and then we had what yellow was in there, so we get a little bit of yellow stuff and some pink as well. So that's our genetic process. And we have then change in genetics of a population from generation one to generation two. Now, that's the population. Now we can apply selection. And so we apply selection by going back to this question. I mentioned that I would unpack this for you, and here we go. Feeding and fleeing, eat and avoid being eaten. There are a gazillion different things that we could guess might be the selection pressure that drove the evolution of early vertebrates. Why, why did I pick this one? Anybody? I'm sorry? It's common for all vertebrates. What do you mean it's common for all vertebrates? It's, we all want to either live or eat. <laughs> you all want to survive or eat? It's primal. It's, right, it's basic stuff, yeah. It's, um, yep. 
you got to do it. You got to eat, and you got to avoid being eaten. And in fact, we have both fossil data and data from living species and population that tell us that certainly predation is a very powerful selection pressure. Okay? Here's a great fossil. Check this out. The Green River Formation 50 million years ago. You get lunch, and then you become a fossil. Wouldn't that, like you get that whatever your favorite food is, I war with myself, do I like donuts or sushi better? I don't know, depends on the day. You eat the sushi and then the building collapses on you, so you're fossil. Okay, so we know that predation is important and um, studies on living species, as I mentioned, are very important for showing that. So that's why we picked this, very basic kind of idea. So for our prey row, the feeding of prey row is going to involve the searching for light. Light is life in biology because that's where primary productivity starts. Photosynthetic organisms convert the energy of sun into glucose, right? So everything goes towards the light, including in the ocean, okay? And then we have tadiator, and tadiator's chasing prey row. Light is food for prey row, and prey row is food for tadiator. I need to mention here, we are not evolving the predator. We're just evolving prey row. We could have evolved the tadiators too, but we chose not to. It would be an obvious next sort of thing to do to co-evolve those two. Generally, in biological systems, predators are longer lived than prey, so it's not a bad first approximation here. Okay, so this is how we're going to apply selection, and I'm going to show you a video now of one of our evolutionary trials, or a part of our evolutionary trial, and I need to orient you here. Here is prey row in the dark. Here's tadiator in the dark. There's a camera mounted 12 feet above the tank looking down. Here's the light source. Okay. We've mounted a green bow light and a red stern light on each of the robots so we can track them in the dark. And what you're going to see happen here is prey row is going to make its way to the light source and tadiator is going to come around here looking for prey row and it's going to sort of detect prey row and then move in and come and nail it in the blind spot. And only at the last second, right around here, are you going to see prey row actually sense that the uh, tadiator is anywhere close. And remember, this is autonomous behavior. We are not remote controlling this. Oh, by the way, this is a jerky video because it's downsampled from 30 frames per second. They actually don't move fast enough for 30 frames per second to be anything but soporific, right? You're like, if we had to analyze 30 frames a second, we'd just be falling asleep. So we downsample it. That's why it's a little bit jerky here. So here we go. Here's Prey Row moving in. Tadiator over here. Starting to come around. It's, it's still actually sort of foraging. It hasn't really picked up Prey Row yet. Prey Row is going right towards the light. Now it's picked up Prey Row. It starts to turn. So Prey Row is thinking, great, somebody put out donuts. I love donuts. Goes over to the donut table and Prey Row comes up on the side and sneaks up in the blind spot right here. And it's not the last moment, right there, a big tail sweep where Prey Row goes, oh shoot, those weren't donuts for everybody, right? And it gets nailed, like gotcha. So Prey Row gets it. So it's those kind of interactions, that's what we would call a kind of behavioral ecology interaction that we can replicate. We run trials three, for three minutes, we run multiple trials for multiple robots in any particular generation. When we do a run of up 10 generations, we end up doing about 180 different kinds of tests. In the book, I've got a, in figure 6.8, I've got this diagram which takes the point by point average position of each of the robots and diagrams it for you so you can see where they start. This is a different trial. You can see when they get close and they interact and how the, what the whole chase pattern looks like there when they're after each other. So very consistent behavior across across our trials. And now this is going to get, I think, to back to your question. Um, we have a judging system. This is how we build our fitness function. For feeding, we're going to reward moving quickly, right? getting to that donut table before anybody else does. Closeness to the donut table. I said sushi or donuts. I guess it's donuts today for me. Okay, Closeness to the light. So you, got, you, know, you know this for like from potlucks. Like there's always the person who's like the first one in line for potlucks. Do you have those people? you guys do potlucks here at Microsoft? No, everything's catered. I'm sorry. Like for those catered banquets that you have every night, you know, the first one in line, you can just predict it, and they stay right there, right? And they let you kind of sneak in, and then they're, they're, they're shoveling the food in. So we reward that behavior here. 
It's important evolutionarily. Fleeing, keeping your distance from the predator and peak acceleration so that when you initiate an escape, that you do so and try to generate high g-forces and that you actually initiate some escapes, escapes. So we reward all five of these features. So it's a composite fitness function to your point here. And this is why it's not simply keeping your distance from the predator. Although we could have done that, right? But then we wouldn't be testing for the combination of feeding and fleeing. It would have just been a kind of fleeing. Yes? Has, uh, have you looked at or it didn't, it didn't become important, like conservation of energy? Like, Wait, you can't do that. Speed you can't just say conservation of energy. Of course, everything comes back to conservation of energy. Badly, but I'm thinking about like just quickly getting to the feeding, right? You could burn a lot of energy. Yep. If you just drift in, then you have more energy for when you want it. You know what I'm saying? I think I do. Right. So you want to be fat. You don't want to be thin and jerky. Right. Efficiency. But you have to. There, there's something to be said though that. You know, one strategy you could think might evolve would be to go to the light source and just sit there, right? But then you're a sitting duck for the predator, right? So there's, again, this idea that there's, a, there's always a compromise with evolution. So yeah, you get there quickly, you grab some food, but then you, you're on the move, right? So you're harder to track for the predator. But this is just one possible fitness function. So you guys, you guys are both exploring the fact that depending on what fitness function you use, this is really the evolutionary judging that's applied, and that's going to give you a different outcome in your evolutionary modeling. So there's no doubt that what you guys are saying is, is correct. Yes? I'm wondering why you chose specific attributes as opposed to making sure just that they got enough light to live on and they didn't get eaten. So, um, yeah, so, so my colleague Rob Root, who was critical about only six, um, he always was like, well, you know, it should just be whether they have energy or not. And this is your point about energy conservation. Why don't we just measure energy? If one of you can figure out how to do that, let me know. We tried mounting solar panels on them, right, and charging batteries. And we said, OK, we'll just let them run down, right? So whoever is continuing to go, we'll just measure how long they can keep going. And the winners are, OK, you were able to harvest the energy. The problem is the starting conditions, as you guys know, Every battery is different. And even the same battery used again is now a different battery because they have histories. So how do you control for that in a battery? So you say, well, you can start measuring things like current draw, and you can keep track of the watt hours that are being used and things like that. And so you could do it, right? And it's just for a simple set of robots, we decided we'll forego that for the next, and save that for the next round. Yes? It actually brings to my question, like, well, what would be the difference if you just did all this in simulation instead of actually building the robots? So what if we did it in simulation? We do do um, evolutionary experiments in simulation. The problem is, so I work with an evolutionary computing uh, specialist, Chun Wai Lu, and this mathematician, Rob. They do the physics engine. They build the physics engine and then do the evolutionary algorithms. And when we were putting together this initial study, um, they were saying that you know what, John, we'll try to slow down so that you guys doing the robots, you know, you're not too many worlds behind us when we do this. Because we're going to go so quickly with the evolutionary simulation that you don't know what, you know, you're not going to know what hit you, right? The joke is they're a world behind us <laughs> in practice. And that's because it's really hard to solve the hydroelastic equations that govern the behavior of the tail with fluid. There are multiple labs in the world working on this. And it involves Navier-Stokes equations, which can be solved with supercomputers. So everybody wants their approximation of Navier-Stokes. And we use the Light Hill approximation when we do it, but it has its own problems. And so the nice thing about robots is that robots can't violate the laws of physics. So even though they're difficult to build, and we can do fewer generations, they give us a better, we're not simulating the physics, we're doing it. You get the physics for free, right? So we actually combine the two processes. And the world that we've done in simulation is the world we started, and I didn't talk to you about it today, but it's in the book, um, just feeding, and looking if, at feeding was, if feeding was sufficient to change the uh, vertebral column, okay? 
So we have done that. You know, and, and the great thing is you can do thousands of generations and you can change the fitness function quickly and you can do all this great stuff. And then it's always a question of validating that simulation. Yes? Variables in a physical robot actually help you more answer, or better answer the initial question whether or not a better vertebrae column helps with evolution. Because it seems like by isolating just the number of vertebrae, that might actually let you just test that component much more simply. Like, and the variables introduced by all these other components, I mean, maybe we'll get to it in your results section, but yeah. here's to know if like, this actually helps significantly. So, yeah, let's, let me go on a little bit. And, and his general question is, does it help to have the complexity in the system? And it's always a balance, right? I mean, our tendency is to apply the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid, and, and do the simplest stuff first. And this is actually TADRO 4, and I'm not telling you about some of the earlier TADRO stuff, which are simpler here. So we, we do have some reasons, but I'll get into it. There was another question here. Yes? So uh, your colleagues who are doing the computer simulation uh -huh. have problems due to the reality gap, right? Where, like, uh, the reality gap, I love that, yeah. How, how bad was it for them to overcome? Like, did they uh, come up with basically an optimal solution that worked in, um, on their computer and then tried it on a robot and realized it kind of fell flat? Or how did that work out? Um, the way it worked out is we got above a certain speed, we got a behavior that was generally like what we're finding in the robots, that they could uh, be self-propelled and autonomous in the sense that they could find the light source. So we could, this was actually Tadro 3, and what we were doing is competing them all together in the Tadro 3 world. So, you know, I'm not saying that simulations are always wrong, and I'm not saying that simulations always violate the laws of physics. It's just, you know, I, I don't know how much modeling you've done, but there, you always have the ability to make your model better <laughs> by tweaking the parameters. So you have to be really careful about it. And, and our guys are, are, are really careful about it, and that's why they're slower is they're just trying to be, trying to do things like, okay, we're actually going to go down at the level of the molecules now, and we are going to look at the flux of ions in the muscles, and we've got to come up with a really good muscle model, because muscle is a dynamic, nonlinear, force-generating system, and that needs to be in there in order to be accurate force-generating mechanism as we're doing our coupled force system with the external fluids. So it's not just the elasticity, it's the fact that the elasticity is then superimposed on this nonlinear force-generating system. So there's lots of stuff, cool stuff to do on the simulation size. Uh, they're trying to reduce the reality gap before they even get crude results. So they're um, are they trying to reduce the reality so gap? Like, rather than trying to come up with a simple physics engine and... Uh, no, no, we have the simple ones. Okay. Yeah, we have the simple. So the, the Light Hill is actually a fairly simple physics engine. So we're working on an immersed boundary layer method uh, that Peskin developed for heart flow. And so we're adapting that immersed boundary layer method. And we have some early simulations that we validate um, in fish swimming at steady speeds. Because the steady speeds are easier than any kind of maneuver or acceleration. So, yeah, we're working on it. Yes? I had a question about the environment, uh, uh -huh. how it's simulated. Uh, don't you think it's, uh, the evolution depends a lot more on environment and uh, the, pre the predator you have used here to be, uh, may not actually mimic the pre predators that were there during that time. And how do you know? It's just, so, 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 it's, the environment is too simple. That's oh, it's a very it's, simple environment, yeah. So it, it looks like an experiment in vacuum where you can say that, oh, uh, vertebrae do help in moving faster, but so does many other physical things which will help in moving faster. Uh, electrical, <laughs> electrical or mechanical engineer? Which one are you? I'm a computer engineer. Computer engineer. <laughs> well, it doesn't quite fit my prediction. <laughs> um, I work with engineers all the time, and engineers, by and large, can't stand doing simple stuff. Right? Because the world is always more complex than your modeling. Right? Our problem is we want to understand the mechanisms that are operating. And so as you add complexity, you make it more difficult to understand what's happening. So your point is correct. It is a very simple environment. Right? But it is more complex than anything that anybody has done so far. So, so allow us to take that first step, okay? And so I take your point, which is correct, but, you know, somebody else will do the next step, which will be more complicated. 
And, and I can tell you that we tossed in a predator because before we just had the animals competing amongst themselves and we thought it was going to be more complex environment to have a predator in there. So, all right, we're almost to the end here. Um, and I had mentioned to you that the best three in any gener generation get to breed. And so we talked about that. So the Tadros are playing the game of life. And let's take a look now at the data that we get. I'm going to show you over 10 generations what happens with just the number of vertebrae. And it's going to be an answer that you had predicted. OK. Um, so here we go from generation 1, or actually over to 11. We did two different runs. These take weeks and weeks and weeks to do, by the way, because we have to build all these tails and things like that. And we have to analyze all the videos. It'd be nice if we could automate that. We haven't done that yet, some of those processes. Number of vertebrae start at the same spot. This is the mean of the population. The error bar represents the standard error as a measure of variance. And what you can see in both cases with a constant selection pressure, the number of vertebrae increases, OK? And then it stabilizes, which, by the way, is something very similar to what we found in simulation, is that there is a, uh, for that population, for the condition of those swimmers, there tends to be a, um, a kind of simple landscape with maybe a single hill, uh, if we're thinking about hill climbing algorithms, right? A simple hill, a single hill when it comes to number of vertebrae. I'll refer you to the book for more complexity, which I think begins to get to some of the questions you were bringing about. When we look at the different characters together, we actually employ uh, analyses that are used in population and quantitative genetics, where we look at variance-covariance matrices and the evolution of the variance-covariance matrix itself. So we do try to take into account those various things. OK, so what we know here is when Tadros play the game of life, the population changes over generational time. And this is evolution. So people ask me, no, no, you're not really evolving your robots, are you? No, we really are. We actually know evolution as a process. We've known it for centuries. That's how we do our domestication of animals, right? That's how we do genetic algorithms for engineering. And we can apply it to robots. It really is evolution. Yes? So it looks like after a period of time, you reach a steady state. Is right. the implication then to continue evolution that you have changes in the environment that then push you again to evolve? I think this is where you would expect maybe a predator to change in response. And so the fact that our predator wasn't co-evolving was, was, was a simplification, to your point, that wasn't realistic. Okay, so then the next time we can go back and we can have the predator actually evolve as well. So that we get into that evolutionary arms race that's going to cause some of those creative changes. Um, yes? Did you try starting with a higher number of vegetables? Yeah, yeah, right. So you, could, you can see here, there's all sorts of things you could do, right? We could go down and start at the ancestral condition of no vertebrae. We could go up and start low. I started us in the middle because I wanted to allow for the possibility that I didn't want a floor effect, right? I didn't want there to, to force vertebrae to evolve. So if we're starting in the middle of the morphous space here, we could, the number of vertebrae could have actually decreased over time. But you're right, that would be another parameter or a starting conditioning that we could change in the system. And that's why the simulations, to your point, would be useful. And so what we do in simulation is we change the starting point. So, Okay, so we're back to Y vertebrae. Back to our cool critters um, from 500 million years ago. And suddenly, my computer has frozen. I guess somebody has told me that, John, you've gone too long <laughs> and you need to stop. So I'll stop with this blank screen, which allows you to imagine all kinds of things and tell you that when we do this kind of work, we're trying to refute a hypothesis. So we were unable to refute the hypothesis that selection pressure for enhanced feeding and fleeing is sufficient to drive the evolution of vertebrae. So we keep this selection pressure of one of many possible that could account for what happened 500 million years ago. Is it the answer? No. We'll never know what the answer is. It is one possible, likely mechanism uh, of what may have happened. And is anybody surprised, oh, jeepers, these are fundamental things. Of course it's going to work, 
right? But you don't know till you try it. And what I can tell you in previous experiments that I talk about in the book, when we just do the feeding without the fleeing, we don't get the same pattern. In fact, we see a decrease in the number of vertebrae. Okay? So in fact, it, it's not a given that just getting out there and eating is going to do it for you. It's a combination of things going on in the world. So thank you. I'll stop right there with my blank screen. And Amy, do we have time for questions? OK. You guys have been asking questions along the way. You've been a very good set of students today. Thank you. Yes? So in using these uh, like kind of composite animals, pseudo animals, did you, and I think it's a pretty unique environment where you can have other interactions that were not foreseen. Did you see any like immersion properties arise of having a big animal that had other controls, like the sensitivity of the light or the components, and just the number of vertebrates that you were testing? So the question is, um, did we see things that we didn't expect to happen because we actually have um, these physically embodied robots uh, working in front of us. I'll tell you about one, right, which was, we think is really cool. Because they're in a tank of finite size, depending on how they start moving around, they start generating currents. They start structuring their environment. And it's one of the really cool things from a cognitive science point of view about working in water is you entrain fluid as you move through it. Imagine if we could walk here and suddenly like you were pulling the floor with you. Right? And then, oh, like you're kind of joining me. It's like, why are you walking with me? Well, you're pulling the floor. Right? So we have started doing experiments where we put 10 of these robots together in a tank, in this tank. And we vary the, and 10 or 8 or 7. And we start looking if they get behavior uh, as a group that's explainable by some of these physical constraints that happen just by virtue of moving in that environment. I don't know. We haven't done that simulation that well. You know, and it's true that some of the far field effects to model are a little bit more difficult than some of the near field things. So it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, okay, I see that we have the same folks who are. <laughs> that's great. You guys are dialed in. Oh, here's somebody new. Yes, go. Try, we'll get back to you. Can you try varying the, the surface area that you move around on to see if that changes a bit? The question is, have we tried varying the surface area, and? Um, in previous experiments, we use slightly smaller tanks. And it's absolutely true that the specific environment matters. So in this particular set of trials, we didn't do that. Okay. In the environment, um, was it just straight water you use, or did you change, say, um, the cost of calcium carbonate, et cetera, all the kind of things that would contribute to the acceleration of the black hole? So the question is, how much should we change the fluid environment? Because you're right, the fluid does, does matter. We didn't mess around with that at all. People have done experiments on living fishes where they play with the viscosity, for example. And they try to tease apart the viscosity effects from the inertial effects in the fluid. And you can do that. Temperature ends, ends up being important for Reynolds number and things like that. OK, go. Uh, I, so since you mentioned you're putting like six or larger numbers, I was curious if you uh, just see schooling without having to program it in. Like it just already comes out of simply being aware of light and uh, temperature or prey. It just happens. Okay. So I'm walking away from you because you have predicted what we're actually trying to write up right now is that in fact um, what we see happening is without any communication among the members in the group that by virtue of sharing a goal, which is to orbit around a light source, there is what looks like coordinated group swarm behavior. So our, we're actually trying to write up a paper right now, um, hopefully it'll get submitted somewhere, to try to strip down what people are ignoring right now with swarm intelligence work, which is that you don't necessarily need to have communication. You just need to have proximity and shared goals. So right on. OK. So you. the linear sensor, how do you detect friend or foe in that scenario where you have multiple fish in the tank? Um, the way we did these trials is it's just having the foe in there. So you're right. That's a simplification. Everything is assumed to be foe. So that would be another piece of complexity that we could add. How do you differentiate between a schoolmate, as it were, and a predator? Yep, that's, that's totally valid. Yes? 
you, you mentioned when the genes were being passed on that you added a little bit of noise every time, yep. like a regularization parameter. How did you choose that? And do you have a feel for how quickly the evolution would be affected by changing that amount of noise? So the, the question is for our mutation operator, how much mutation did we put in each time and did, did we know how much that was going to uh, affect it? In previous um, worlds that we've run, we, we, we had too much of that going on, so we dialed it down. So it's in part a, you can do your simulations to get a sense of that, but then you actually have to run your experiments and get a feel for it. All of this stuff, like the sensitivity of the eyes to light, it, it's got to work for that environment. So you fiddle around to kind of get it to sort of work. You can't have the predators be too good, right? Because then all you have is the predator going boom, boom, boom. So you have to balance these out a little bit. So in fact, the modeling, you run into the same kinds of problems in modeling with the embodied robots in this regard that you do with uh, digital simulation as well. You know, there's the, the sensitivity analysis or robustness, uh, what's the word, uh, where you see if your variables are actually um, changing anything in your model. What's that process? Uh, it's a sensitivity analysis is what that is. So you, have to, you definitely have to do that and work through that. Um, so, no, that's a, that's, a, that's a good point. Now, how did we, so, so we used a Poisson distribution for our randomness and we, pardon me? <laughs> exactly, right, thank you, that was good. Um, yes, we'll get back to you next. Um, <coughs> so in, in the video you showed the predator was swimming around in the dark. Why, why does the predator just hang out at the light? Take off? I don't know, you'll have to ask the predator. So the question was, <laughs> why doesn't the predator just hang around the light source? And there are absolutely sit and wait predators who do just that kind of thing. And what I can say is that would be another model to run, is you have a predator that hangs out and so then you have different strategies that could evolve. So, nope, that's, that's realistic. Sir? How did you come up with your concept of gold, silver, bronze, and the weighting when it seems that just a minimum bars what's required for procreation? Yeah, so the question about how do we do this ranking um, of the top three, and that's again the sort of having done this before, we had tried to assign a continuous spectrum of um, fitness to individuals, and what we found uh, that sometimes there wouldn't be enough differences among individuals to allow there to be differential reproduction. So to ensure that, we did a ranking. So when we were doing it, mathemat and this is the mathematics of small numbers again, right, sort of lurking about. Um, so we forced it, the system, to give us this ranking when in fact there were differences. Because sometimes we were covering up the differences before. And it turns out there's a field of evolutionary robotics I call this field evolutionary biorobotics because we're doing it specifically to test biological hypotheses. There's a field of evolutionary robotics that's been promulgated by Nolfi and Floriano, two uh, Italian engineers. And they talk about the various kinds of ways that you can do these mating algorithms as part of it. And you know, each one has, a, has an effect in a, way, in a time that it's useful or not useful. So these are parameters or um, situations that have been explored. And I recommend their book if you're interested, Evolutionary Robotics, um, MIT Press. Yes, I'm not supposed to be selling other books though. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Go. So for your fitness <coughs> question, I, I know you enumerated several different variables. Uh -huh. um, so uh, how, did, how exactly did you combine these all together to create a oh. number for fitness? And how complicated was that equation? How did you decide on the weights? And See, that? I didn't know what you guys were going to be like today. So I give you my, this is the sort of technical talk, but not a really technical talk. I should have shown you the fitness function, and actually I, I have it somewhere if my computer wasn't frozen. What we do are z-scores. And so we sum z-scores for each of these things uh, across, in, within a generation, we sum the z-scores. So it's a relative fitness function, so it's only good for that generation. So you sum the z-scores for each of the attributes? So Correct. There yep. are no weights, so they're all weighted evenly? Well, the z-score does, normalizes, yeah, right? Yeah, but each trait. So like, for example, for... I'm laughing because the mathematician, my friend, brings this up all the time. We need to have coefficients in here. And so we went, the z-scores was the next step in the fitness function. He would like to get us to weighting. But then the question is, you can have any weight in the world. Which weights do you choose, right? So again, that's almost a better thing to mess around with in simulation. And so you, we just picked weights of one. How's that? 
Sir. Uh, in your paper, are you going to definitely confine your inferences just to the uh, fluid media that uh, this happened in versus saying something like uh, in biological evolution in fluids, you know, when you leave that swarming effect? Is it, um, you're only going to talk about that specific fluid that constituted the experiment. Are you offering to edit the paper? That's a, I don't know yet, honestly. <laughs> well, how we're going to frame that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's a good point. So yes. in your slide, you have the gold, silver, bronze, and the gold giving uh, six pairs, mm -hmm. right? Four and two, so you have twelve cycle pairs. How did you pick the six, and does that skew your results because you're artificially picking six out of the multitude of combinations? So this is, a, this is a brand of question that you guys are asking, and, it's, and they're all correct, right? So the question is, does the way we picked 6, 4, and 2 affect the results? You used the word skew. I would rather do the more neutral affect the results. It absolutely affects the results. You would get a different result if you did A, 2, and 2, or something like that. And that's, so all these, all these choices um, are sensitive to it. The neat thing is that we are starting to see, the more trials we do, some robustness in some of the answers that we get. Okay? And I was really happy when we re-ran the trial, that we, we sort of replicated it, um, that initial pattern. It was trying to keep all the conditions the same. I just wanted to see if we could replicate it. So whatever random factors are in there, to your point, the fact that we could replicate that in the two different trials says that the, rep, that the randomness isn't just swamping the system, or else we would expect very different patterns to emerge. Both came to 11 as the ultimate right. number of vertebrae. Yep. Yeah. Give you a chance to sign oh. some books. Thank you. Okay, thank you all very much.